Welcome, everybody. And good evening, students, colleagues, fellow citizens. Um, on behalf of Radboud Reflects and Boom Uitgevers, I would like to warmly welcome you to this evening's lecture by Professor Marcus Gabriel. Professor Marcus Gabriel holds the Chair for Epistemology and Modern and Contemporary Philosophy at the University of Bonn. And you might know him as one of the trailblazers of what has, been, uh, what has come to be known as New Realism, a style or perhaps even method of philosophy that aims to present viable alternatives to the excesses of postmodern skepticism, the idea that reality is just a human construct, as well as to scientific, scientific materialism, or the idea that reality is just a bunch of physical lumps. Professor Gabriel has, is the author of numerous articles and books, and three of those books have been translated into Dutch as a trilogy, um, respectively, Waarom de wereld niet bestaat, Waarom we vrij zijn als we denken, and most recently, De zin van denken, which is this book. Themes from this last book uh, within the trilogy will be the focal point of tonight's lecture, hence the title Making Sense of Thinking. After the lecture, Professor Gabriel will be interviewed by Dr. Klein Herenbrink, who happens to be me. <laughs> and there will be room for questions from the audience, from you, after the interview. So not during the lecture and also not during the interview. So if you have any questions, please save them for the third part of tonight's program. I have also been asked to recommend the book table, um, which will be outside of this lecture hall uh, once you exit, where you can buy this book as well as others. And I've also just been informed by my colleagues from Radboud Reflects that one of their um, people called Max will actually eat his shoes if they sell out tonight. And they've also promised to post video materials on their website if and when that happens. Now, I know there are 200 and something people in here, so if one out of three buys a book, we should be all right, and I think this is definitely a good idea. But before <laughs> we do that, I would, like to give, I would like you to give a very warm round of applause to Professor Marcus Gabriel. Well, thank you, Ian. It's a great pleasure to be back. It's already my third time, so it's, my, it's a trilogy. <laughs> uh, uh, love to be here. Um, so tonight I will talk about, uh, you know, contents of the book, but more specifically, I will divide my reflections in uh, three parts. First, I will tell you what uh, truth, uh, thought, and uh, perception are. That's good to know, and reality. Um, uh, but that's not it, that's just the first part. Um, then, then the second part, way more interesting, I will argue for a view I call uh, biological uh, externalism, which means that you are necessarily an animal. Okay, you're not just that, you know, you're all sorts of other things, here, drunk, or etc. But, you know, being an animal is something you necessarily are. Okay, so you, there's no way out. <laughs> and uh, in the third part, I will use these thoughts in order to make you aware of the fact that the uh, contemporary AI, AI, artificial intelligence ideology, does more harm to you than you thought before that lecture. Okay? So you might also say part one and part two are exercises of logical terrorism directed at the heart of Google and Facebook, and then I will make that explicit in the third part. But given that I'm a philosopher, attacks on big corporate uh, businesses have to be purely rational. Okay, I'm a philosopher, not a Marxist. Marx would say, destroy them. I, I'd say, let's interpret the world rightly and then kick their asses because this will trigger, you know, but that's a more complicated story of what follows. Let's see what the rational structure is of what I have to tell you tonight. So part one, uh, truth, uh, thought, perception, and reality. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it's, uh, the topics are less, bigger, uh, than, uh, less big than you might have thought. Okay, let's approach them piece by piece. Um, what is perception. How do I want to use this term? So what, let's start there. That's an, an important concept that we need to fully understand and unpack. Perception is the following thing. Someone, clearly some kind of animal like us, could be whatever it takes to be someone, someone is in touch fallibly with how things are. 
So if you know, for instance, I, l let's think about something that could be the case. Angela Merkel is in Brussels, you know, convincing her friend to take over, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, um, so that's what she's doing. But she might not be in Brussels, right? So if you think that Angela Merkel is in Brussels, you can be right or wrong about that fact. Now, one way of checking where she is is going there, right? Then you might know where she is, and that is perception. If you see Angela Merkel in Brussels, then your perception is what gives you the right answer to the question where Angela Merkel is. You can also just call her if you have her phone number, or call the NSA, they have her phone number, or use any other kind of hacking technique uh, that you might have learned in order to see where she actually is. But whatever you do, okay, you are fallibly in contact with Angela Merkel. Now, Angela Merkel is somewhere, say Berlin. If Angela Merkel is in Berlin, then it is true that Angela Merkel is in Berlin and not false. Otherwise, she wouldn't be in Berlin. So Angela Merkel's being in Berlin and Angela Merkel's being such that it's true that Angela Merkel in Berlin is, uh, is in Berlin are the same thing. Now, what this means, I'm saying this in order to emphasize that truth, the existence of truth, is obvious. Many people have doubted for ideological reasons and some more or less scientific reasons that there is no truth, but only illusions of some sort. But what I've just said means that I'm affirming that, of course, there's truth, right? For instance, I'm currently moving around my left arm. Now, that's true. I might not know this. Not, not everyone on planet Earth knows that I right now move my left arm. It's also not very interesting. Um, but that I just did that, right? That is a fact. Now, you see, there can't be any alternative facts, because if there were, there would be more facts, right? There's this fact, and there's an alternative fact that I move my right arm. I can also move both of them together. But it's impossible that there's a fact which isn't a fact. A fact is something which is true. So facts and truth are connected to reality. Because reality, let's define that, what reality is. Reality is what you can be wrong about. Okay, so I can be wrong about the distance between Nijmegen and Amsterdam. I have a guess, 200 kilometers, maybe less. So I'm probably wrong about the exact distance. Therefore, the distance is real. I can be wrong about Big Bang. Therefore, Big Bang is real. I can be wrong about myself. Therefore, I am real. So whatever you can be right or wrong about is real. What puts you in touch with how things are is perception. Now, let's make things more complicated. And uh, I will tell you a story that many of you might or might not believe, but it's a very natural story, extremely widely spread in popular culture, science, basically everywhere. So most people believe something like the following. Right? The fact that I see you right now, that I'm in the state of perceiving you in different sense modalities. I smell you, you know, not individually. I see you, etc. Yeah, right? I could touch you, etc., uh, etc. Et so I'm in you know, contact with you via perception. And now someone could say the following, which sounds entirely obvious to most people these days. This goes like this. Right? There's an information source, a light source. Right? Light's turned on. And light is simply such that you know, photons on, and whatever does it right, hits the surface of things. That's not quite precise because there's an, uh, you know, basically this is just field interaction. But let's you know, make it less physical and so that it sounds more plausible. Right? So you know, light hits the table, and then light hits my nerve ends. And then a process starts, right? Uh, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the various nerves are connected. Nerves are con and at some point in that story, which is very fast, that's why you don't notice it, right? If you say, well, stop, I've never noticed that this is going on. You know, I, I see people, but I've never noticed that this whole machinery is going on in the back of my mind or in my brain, right? I've never noticed that. And then they say, oh, yeah, here's why. It's very fast. You can't notice it's very fast. Okay. Now, that sounds strange to me, so let's question the idea and ask the following very simple question to someone who thinks that. If there's a mental 
image in my mind, which is the result of these chains, right? Light hitting the table, hitting my nerve ends, uh, various uh, subsystems of the central nervous system interacting, blah, 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 the cortex, you know, all of that. And then at the end of this very long process, I think I see you. But if this story is true, I cannot see you. Because you are physical fields. I see people, not physical fields. That's the point of the story. The point of the story is that reality is different from what it seems. That's part of the story. Otherwise, you wouldn't need physics. You wouldn't know physics by opening your eyes, right? So you need to be thinking about that. But the thought is incoherent. Because the view tells you that you cannot see reality. But this is the standard view. So most people believe that this is the nature of perception. That perception is the construction of mental images based on sensory hits that your organism gets from an environment which no one understands. Now, if that were true, we would be, you know, brutally alienated from reality. Uh, so reality would be exactly like Twitter. You know, currently, there's still a difference between reality and Twitter. You know, they're approaching each other. But on that account, you will be in Twitter or in the matrix, as people imagine it, right? Or you will be a transhumanist uploaded to the network of pure information or whatever other fantasy uh, people might have about that. But that view is simply false, okay? So we need another view, and that's uh, kind of an obvious view. Uh, and I try to sketch that. There are facts... And we are fallibly in touch with them. And that is perception. Now, why would someone think that our thinking is not a sense organ? You know, I will defend now that it is. But why would someone think that our thinking is not a sense organ, right? So let me give you some sense organs or sense modalities, to be more precise. You know, vision, hearing, touching, etc. So reality comes to you in, in shapes and colors and smells, etc. Philosophers call them qualia. That's all what I mean by this, qualitative states that you can be in, be in a smell, the taste of chocolate, etc. Now, um, uh, they are around, right? These qualia and perceptions, etc. But why would thinking not be a sense organ in the story? Well, a very, very old thought... Aristotle started it, arguably. There's something like that in earlier philosophers. So here's the thought. Because thinking puts the various qualities of my life together. If I know, you know, there's a little sugar cube, right? I can taste it. It's sweet, hopefully. If it's sugar, you know, and I'm not sick, it's sweet. It's white. It feels a certain way, etc. So you connect those states, that, uh, and then you think the same thing is white, it looks like a cube, tastes uh, sweet, etc. But you don't see that it's the same thing. You don't see the difference between seeing and smelling. Right? You smell something and you see something. But that, that is not the same as nothing you see or smell. You don't smell seeing, you see. Unless in certain states that are easier to be had in this country for legality reasons than in my country. Uh, and, uh, um, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, synesthesia is not, the, is not the standard case. I'm not saying it's, uh, you know, no one should have it. All I'm saying is not, it's not the most widespread one. And even in this case, there's still just one set of sense modalities. Now, the problem with this view is um, most uh, prominently defended by Descartes explicitly. René Descartes defended just that view, you know, very clearly, but it's ancient. The problem with this idea is the following. Again, you cannot understand reality if this is true. Because then thinking that there's a table in front of me would be a wild hypothesis, right? So all that's coming in is a white surface, which kind of looks elliptical, even though I know it's round, you know, uh, it feels a certain way. I never tasted it, I won't uh, in public, <laughs> uh, uh, etc. You know, I might, might have before I came uh, and do later, but right, and uh, so I can touch this damn thing, right? But is there, you know, now I might wonder, but is there really a table? I mean, I can't see it. I see white, but not the table. I cannot touch it, you know, it feels hard, but not like table, it's just hardness. Yeah. So basically, I cannot see the table, you know. And that is what Descartes thought. Descartes thought that Descartes cannot see tables. That's why, you know, it's a bad view. That's why, that's why he thought that he was entirely disconnected from his body. Yeah. Descartes is not his body. If he looks in the mirror and he looks and says, oh, that, that thing, 
you know, it's not me. He would look at it and say, that thing is not me. But that's false. You know, he was a beast and he died. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, um, I would have liked to meet him, but uh, he was a mortal animal, like me. Um, so part one, right, in this, what I'm sketching you, is like just giving you a sense for the following fact about humans. We think about thinking. You all have ideas about what it is that you're doing when you're thinking. You think yourselves as thinkers, all of you, in some way or another. Some in this room might believe that they have an immortal soul, That's the way in which they think of themselves, right? Uh, worth the attention of a super uh, almighty being, you know? Wonderful if you merit that. Uh, I'm not arguing against it at all, all right? It's just one way of thinking about yourself. And some other person might say, think of herself as, you know, like a slightly sophisticated killer uh, ape designed to spread genes and pretend that they are nice, right? And then you work at Wall Street, etc. You can make a lot of money with this kind of self-conception or become the president of the United States. And uh, uh, it's a particular form of mentality, you know, uh, or what the philosopher Gottlob Frege called a hitherto unknown form of madness. Um, <clears throat> but you see, it's a, it's a way of being human, a strange way of being human. And there are many, many other ways of being human. And these ways of being human express the way in which you secretly think about thinking. And that's the sense in which all humans are philosophers, because philosophy, philosophy is just a scientific discipline uh, doing that, thinking about thinking. Philosophers like to sit in, room, in quiet rooms, as Nietzsche said, and that's basic, maybe that's why we're doing it. I don't know what the order of explanation is. Either we like to think about thinking and therefore sit in quiet rooms, or we like to sit in quiet rooms and therefore think about thinking. That has never been figured out. These are materialism versus idealism. Um, uh, but, you know, these are good questions. Uh, but I won't try to answer them. What matters is that you are thinking about thinking. And what you think about your thinking determines who you are. That's what people now call an identity. Yeah? Your social identity is a function of how you think about yourself as a thinker. So racism is the view that someone only thinks something that she thinks because she has a certain skin color. Yeah? Uh, optimism is the view that uh, you know, someone is a thinker if and only if she always gets it right. You know, Catholics are optimists about the Pope, uh, but they're wrong. Uh, uh, about the Pope in, the, in this particular case. Um, so, you know, the way in which you relate to the fact that you are a thinker and others are thinkers determines, co-determines what you are. And this get, often gets overlooked. So let's come to the second part um, on the human animal, biological externalism. So on the basis of some of the things that I've suggested, um, you might want to become a so-called idealist. This happens to lots of people in my country. That's why it's called German idealism. It's a particular form of German madness. Uh, 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 I have sympathies for it. I've been around. Um, so let me give you a, a brief summary or trailer of German idealism. Best off in three minutes. That should be sufficient for our purposes. So they had the majestic idea that um, <clears throat> the fact that you think about thinking means that you are above nature. So there's some realm, and that realm determines what really exists. And part of this realm, only a very small part of this realm, is nature. So they had the idea that the universe was a very small thing, even if it's as big as we think it is, very small thing, compared to something larger, which they called Geist. And this something larger determines events in the smaller Uh, for instance, if I do something, like I buy a Twix, right? I buy a Twix. Then they think that a large thing determined my mental states and acted through my hands. Uh, the thing which likes Twix, right? The Twix consumer, as it were. You can so so sociologize the idea, and it's called sociology. So sociology in the 19th century was invented in order to spell this out, basically, uh, in a slightly more scientific-sounding fashion. Now, that view, okay... Uh, is also the birthplace of current AI, artificial intelligence ideology. Uh, um, uh, for, uh, here's evidence for this. Uh, ironic, but maybe not. Um, you know, one of the main works of German idealism is called 
Die Wissenschaftslehre, The Science of Science is one translation by Johann Gottlieb Fichtes, one of the major books uh, which defends this idea that humans are above their uh, animality. Our animality is something we are entirely in control of and we are beyond it. By being thinkers, we are beyond animality. We are gods. That's what he literally thought. And, but another good translation into English of Wissenschaftslehre would be Scientology. You know, that would be the literal translation. And so I, I, I think this is, there's you know, a, a degree to which this is non-coincidental. Remarkably, this is the uh, friend, a recent Francis Fukuyama view, if you have read the Identity book. Uh, so the most recent uh, Francis Fukuyama book uh, defends just that idea. He thinks that Kant and Hegel invented the kind of mind frame which is uh, basically running California right now. Uh, um, so that's an idea that he has. There are some interesting things to be said. But anyhow, um, what is more interesting at this point is let's ask the following question. Are we necessarily animals? You know, it could be that we are animals and we happen to be animals. Well, we could not have been animals. So imagine uh, you have an immortal soul and there's a, there's a rebirth option. It's a thought experiment, right? I don't know how it works, but, you know, so that's why it's a thought experiment. But imagine you have an immortal soul and you come into existence either for the first time or uh, on the Hinduist version of the thought experiment for the 728th time. Okay, but anyhow, so this is the crucial moment before picking an existence. And uh, uh, um, if you think that you could not, might not have been an animal, then, in this, uh, then you think that it was an option before you were born, for instance, to pick an animal. You know, I, I don't want to be a human. They are animals. Uh, uh, so I take another picket. I want uh, take it. I want to be an angel or something like that, right? So in this case, you would be contingently, by chance, an animal. And many people worry that this might be true, right? That they're contingently animals. Now, I want to argue that this is not the case, that you are necessarily animals, so there's no way out. Yeah. But this is also good news, you know. It turns out that you are who you are. You know? So I'm not taking that away. Um, um, but so here's how it goes. If we necessarily are animals, then that means that for what we are, there will always be necessary biological preconditions for its existence. Here's what that means. Um, if I raise my left hand, I need a left hand, right? If I had a robot arm, I would have moved up my robot arm, but it wouldn't be my left hand. It would be a replacement. My left hand happens to be a thing which consists of cells, right? That thing has cells. It happens to have cells. Now, that thing is, of course, necessarily biological. You know, otherwise, it, you know, it has cells. What it is, is it has cells. If it didn't have cells, it wouldn't be that thing. Yeah? So it's necessarily that thing. Now, the question is, what happens if I have a state which isn't obviously or maybe not at all entirely physical, such as being scared of Brexit? Right? So imagine I'm scared of Brexit. I don't know what my relationship emotional is to Brexit. I need to figure that out, like every, everyone. Uh, but anyhow, so there's something and we don't know what it is and we all have uh, emotional reactions when we hear the name. Uh, and uh, that state that I'm in is not reducible, meaning not simply identical with a bodily state of mine. Right? I couldn't have this you know, feel visceral shame when I see Boris Johnson say, right? It's visceral. Yeah. Uh, I got really sick uh, uh, when I traveled to the United States for the first time after Trump's election. Uh, I was staying very close to the Trump Tower. Uh, uh, so I had all sorts of fantasies of what that meant, you know, just being around uh, after a historical shock. I'm not even interpreting it, right? I'm not saying it's good or bad. It's just like being around for shock. And then there's this visceral thing, that reaction. Now, is it essential for that thing for you to happen, right? Is this essential for who you are? And biological externalism, the view that I defend, says yes. Uh, um, so the fact that we are animals is a necessary fact about ourselves. We couldn't have been angels. Uh, um, so that's just impossible. If you are one of those, one of the present, uh, here I have to, you know, I'm sorry to break the news, you were animals. But, you know, you should have known because no one really ever denied that in a certain sense. People just dis disagreed about what that meant. Uh, but that is what I want to say about that. Now, this has consequences, part three, where we uh, do a lot of, you know, political action. It's almost activism, what I'm giving you now. 
uh, this has consequences for the philosophy of so-called artificial intelligence. Um, so let me tell you what intelligence is, what artificial means, and why there is no, strictly speaking, either no artificial intelligence or we are one, and what this means for uh, our time. So intelligence is the capacity to solve a given problem in a given amount of time. Let me repeat that definition and tell you why I say this. So intelligence is the capacity to solve a given problem in a given amount of time. If you solve the same problem quicker than some other system, your neighbor, then you are more intelligent than that other system with respect to that task. That doesn't mean that you're generally more intelligent, but you're more intelligent at doing X, Y, and Z. Right? So that's all we can measure, by the way. Yeah. There's no such thing as general intelligence in humans either. People sometimes wonder, you know, what are, there's no such thing, it doesn't exist. But anyhow, we can measure specific uh, forms of intelligence uh, in uh, humans. Now, those intelligences exist because we have problems. You're good at making coffee or cooking or whatever because it solves a survival problem in the first instance. Most problems that you solve every day are survival problems, uh, but we have outsourced a lot of them, so it's easier to, survive, uh, you know, to solve them. So we have become more intelligent with respect to certain things, you know, such as guaranteeing that you can get food you know, within the next 10 minutes. You know, in many places, Amsterdam, you, know, uh, you can get almost wherever you are, you can get food in 10 minutes. Yeah. Uh, New York is better. You know, you can, it's 24-7, so the same thing. But, you know, wherever you are, it's at most 10 minutes and you have food. Now, had you been in wildly different circumstances, it wouldn't have been that simple, okay? So we are more intelligent with respect to the availability of food. But we are very stupid with respect to the possibility of surviving for the next 200 years. Yeah, for the same reason. We are very good at solving the food problem for us in such a way that we destroy the possibility of food in the future. And then we kind of get worried but we don't change anything because we are running on this great program which gives us food within 10 minutes. Yeah, so who would change that? Yeah. Now you might say we should change that. Well, we should, but no one does. So why? Because they're enjoying it. Uh, uh, they are just enjoying it. That's, uh, we need to understand that, that people enjoy destroying the planet. That's, I think the first part of a recognition of what we ought to do is understand the fact that people have a dirt, the dirty desire to destroy the habitat of others. It's a bad thing, right? But uh, okay, good. Uh, now something more positive. Um, okay, uh, Alice in Wonderland exists as part of your imagination. So okay, now we are up back again uh, at, uh, at better things. So that's what intelligence is. This immediately entails that nothing can be intelligent without having a problem. Nothing that doesn't have a problem can be intelligent. Now, does the wall have a problem? No, the wall doesn't have the problem of standing there. We have the problem of guaranteeing that it stands. That's why we worry about earthquakes or tides in this part of the world, right? Uh, huge tides. Uh, um, but th that's, that's our problem, not the wall's problem. If the wall breaks down, nothing happened to it, right? It's not like, damn, I'm breaking down. No one's at home, okay? It's a, a, a stupid is an exaggeration for its degree of intelligence. It's not even a candidate. Now, why would you think that your smartphone is not like the wall. And what I'm saying is your smartphone is exactly like the wall, except that it's a smartphone, right? uh, but ontologically speaking in its core. Apart from that, they're very different. But in the, in the you know, uh, you can use the one to Google and not this one, of course, right? Um, uh, but that is, in, in their ontology, in their way of being, they are the same. Why are we different? Well, because we are necessarily animals. So we have problems. That's why we're intelligent. Intelligence is nothing but a response to the fact that you have problems of a certain kind. If you take these problems out of reality, if all humans disappear, all artifacts, which we think of as intelligent, smartphones, the internet, whatever, break down within a very short amount of time. Because, you know, where do they get their power? How do they even get to their power source? There's no artifact producing artifacts guaranteeing the further existence of other artifacts, right? There's no super plant which produces plants and programs and smartphones. That's what people tell us when they suggest that the coming super intelligence will automate everything. That's the idea of a plant, a mega plant, right? An ND 
printer, you know, in any dimension the thing can print. And uh, that thing will be such that we never have to work again. And the question is, what shall we be? Artists. We should be artists. Or whatever, you know, if you're, you've heard that debate. And uh, that is a ridiculous fantasy if I'm right. Uh, um, it's ridiculous because it's uh, premised on the very false idea uh, that intelligence or intelligent behavior could be anything but a model of what we are doing. So let me conclude with that thought. Because what I'm saying is not what you might have heard of from so John Searle's so-called Chinese room argument. If you don't know this, let me just quickly repeat it uh, and distinguish what I'm saying from that. Some of this sounds similar, but uh, the Chinese room argument isn't good. So here's how it goes. Uh, so John Searle, uh, a philosopher from uh, Berkeley, he's in a room and there are two slots. Uh, and uh, he has a rule book for Chinese, but not a real grammar or anything. It just tells him if this uh, sign comes in, put it next to that sign and, uh, uh, you know, and then hand them out through this window. And uh, on the two ends are two, say, Chinese speakers, and they communicate by using John Searle. Right? So the one hands in this character, Wa, and then the second character, Zhao, Marcus, uh, whatever, you know, he hands this uh, in, and, uh, and the guy at the other end reads, I am Marcus. Oh, Marcus. Yeah, you know, and, and John doesn't know any Chinese. He has no idea what he's doing. Now, John Searle claimed that computers are, not, are like John Searle in the Chinese room argument. Given that they don't understand anything, they cannot be intelligent. That was his argument, right? John doesn't understand Chinese, but he processes science. Computers don't understand anything because they're just processing science. That was his idea. Yeah? Uh, uh, what I'm saying is slightly different. Uh, it is the following idea. Computers, are so-called computers or programs, are nothing but models of how we think. Nowadays, this is called data. A datum is a model of something I did. For instance, a photo. You know, like why, you know, what is Facebook doing when they're data mining? They take the way you think about yourself. You literally gave them the way you think about yourself in your timeline, you know, what you would like to be, etc. You don't send them pictures of, say, your broken leg. So if you just broke your leg, right, it's not on Facebook usually, right? That's not how it works. And there, there are clearly there, there's, there are things you can post there and things you cannot post there. And uh, mutatis mutandis for all social networks. So what you do is you tell them in a story of images how you see yourself. That's why it's aptly called Facebook. They got that right. So you tell them how you think. And, uh, and the, uh, the way, what you think is an act, right? An action. Now I think of myself as being a speaker, say, so I take this photo, lecturing and right bone, you know, uh, post, like, you know, uh, and, uh, and so if I did that, right, I would think of myself as lecturing and, you know, knife me, and that's what I would do, right, and, uh, and this is what people could see. Oh, Gabriel thinks of himself as lecturing in Nijmegen because thoughts are perceptions, right? They can literally see my mind. Minds are objective. Minds are not in my skull. We often think that our minds are in the skull. We can hide our minds. But then we look suspicious and we don't notice, right? If hiding your mind was so easy, we would all be spies, right? Uh, 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 being a spy, you know, uh, you know that's the, the James Bond is a bad spy because he looks like a spy. I mean, if you see James Bond, it's like, spy. Right? I mean, uh, 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 so that's, you know, that, that's why, you know, James Bond doesn't work. It's a bad spy. Uh, part of why this whole thing is kitsch, right? Uh, they should have picked a good spy. But then it wouldn't have looked like a spy movie. Yeah. So maybe Alice in Wonderland is a spy movie uh, on that account. Now, anyhow, um, but a model of your thought, right, is not a copy of your thought. Madudodam is not a copy of the Netherlands, right? Uh, otherwise, it would be too big, right? It would be, you would be in it. Right. It works because you go there and it's contained and you can feel like you see the whole country. Right? Uh, but you can't, so this is a model. It's relevantly connected to the Netherlands, but clearly not identical. And the difference between a so-called algorithm, or more complicated, a real program, and human thought is like, ontologically, in its mode of being, like the difference between a model and a reality. 
here's something that many people think at this point. Uh, I call this the model model. Uh, it's a bad, bad model. Yeah, it's a model model. So here's the model model. Um, don't think of Giselle, Giselle Bündchen. Okay. Um, so a model model, uh, or the model model, is the following line of thought. How do I know anything about reality? Well, by way of experiment. That's a good one, right? I mean, how did we find out that there's gravity? Well, by way of experiment. We connected data, right, uh, by way of experiment. That means we had a model of what happens. We didn't just see it. We had a model of it. And the models got better, and then that's the progress of science and technology. We started with a primitive model of some natural events, turned out to be surprising, then wrote some math for it, and uh, turned out to be, to be a good idea. Then Leibniz, the German philosopher, shows up and says, we should turn this into technology, and they, and they couldn't. <laughs> and then it took 200 more years, and then, unfortunately, they could. And uh, the, now we are here. And uh, so in that storyline, okay, what they did is just create a more complicated model of thought. That's why, for instance, the internet feels so, as it were, spiritual and communicative. You think that you're in touch with someone, with your friends, say, right? You think you're in touch with them, but you're, but you're in touch with the way they think. You don't see your friends. Seeing your friends is different, right? If you're in a restaurant with someone, because the other sense modalities are in play. If you're online with your friends, you're still dealing with them, but the mode of communication is a different mode of communication. It's a medium. And that mode of communication has the problem that it constantly produces ways of thinking about each other that are then harvested by people who can use this information to fight us. Okay, here's how this works, very simple. Something is social if and only if it is the result of two minds interacting with each other knowingly. So we are in a social relation because you know I have a mind. I'm here, hopefully you think that. Uh, um, you know, I try my best to convince you that there's something going on in my mind. But anyhow, so let's assume we agree that there are lots of minds here. And uh, we all relate to the situation that we're in on this level. Uh, we sit, for instance, and don't dance. You know, why are you not dancing? There could be a Bollywood version of philosophy lectures, right? But there isn't. And so, the, because we think about the expectations that constitute the situation in a certain way. Now, the online communication produces social facts that are 100% visible because they are written in code. It's a, it's a universal code which can be hacked by anyone. No firewall is so good that it cannot be penetrated in principle. It can be demonstrated with mathematical certainty, that axiom. That's not an axiom. That's a, uh, but that can be demonstrated. Okay? So the Great Firewall of China is fantastic. has good reasons why it's working. right? But it's penetrable. Nothing cannot be in principle. So what we do in online communication is we produce objective minds that are not in our control. And we don't realize that because these objective minds then turn into mega fantasies, right? As it were, uh, you know, they are fusions of fantasies. And these, let me give you an example of a fusion of fantasies. Donald Trump, right? So he's a fusion of fantasies. That's why no one knows what he's up to. You're like, what is Donald Trump up, up to? And now pick your favorite theory. But it's not obvious uh, it's, it's like, like we all know. People have the, 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 uh, you know, so many perceptions of what he might be up to. Or what's, you know, what, we sh what should we do with the European Union? If you ask such a question, like, what should we do with it? Uh, um, then there are all sorts of thoughts that you can have about it. Right? And that fusion of thoughts can be extremely powerful. And what I see as a problem of our time is that a bad way of thinking about thinking... Okay, it's turning into a fusion of bad ideas. So the internet has turned into a melting pot of bad ideas. Uh, um, so there are some good ideas. But if you have too many bad ideas in the picture, the whole thing gets ruined. Right? You have a good soup and bad meat. You know? uh, um, so you have to steer around the meat. and you know, uh, That destroys the whole soup experience. And now imagine you have the, the density of falsity uh, that is uh, uh, online communication. 
And the falsity is simply this. It doesn't matter whether things that are said are true. Let me conclude with another interesting uh, term uh, that characterizes this situation. Bullshit. The philosopher Harry Frankfurt has written a very nice short book called Bullshit about that, and he says bullshit is a form of communication where the, uh, it doesn't matter that what you say is true or false. So you say something, and your whole speech has the only function of being neutral with respect to the truth. That's bullshit. You just talk. You know, filibuster. Blah, 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 blah. Right? Uh, uh, just for the sake of talking. And the discourse is not interested in the truth. Uh, that's bullshit. And I think what we are witnessing right now is a spread of bullshit based on misguided conceptions of human nature. People are profoundly wrong about the fact that we are necessarily animals and think that there is a digital possibility of overcoming the state of nature, okay? of digitalizing the human realm, the human life form, to such an extent that we overcome the animal part. But that is just impossible. Uh, that's like wishing that the number four were the number five. Let's, let's turn the number four into the number five. You know, no one can do this. Oh, we can. The software companies will turn the number four into the number five. And this is a lot of what's going on today, is the attempt to do the impossible, namely overcome human nature. And as a conclusion, I just want to suggest that our experience of crisis, right? There are all these experiences, the perceptions of, you know, take your preferred perception of crisis, right? I mean, what did you worry about today, right? Which specific political or economic problem did you worry about today? And you will realize that there were lots, right? Lots of things. Huh? And some of them will be similar to things that other people worry about. And this cloud, huh? this cloud of worry, is artificial intelligence. Because we are the only intelligence which can change itself by being wrong about itself. That's called ideology. And we can change the way we are by being wrong about ourselves. Last word as an example. Um, imagine I would begin to think that I'm a very talented tango dancer. I can hardly walk, right? I can run a bit, etc. You know, I can do some things, but tango, forget it. Uh, um, so it's just important. But I start thinking that maybe, right? So uh, I, I might have been in Buenos Aires. I danced clumsily. And they said, you're a very talented uh, tango dancer. But it's just a local custom to be nice to Germans. And, uh, uh, you know, and, uh, and then you know, I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm, you know, maybe I am a good tango dancer. So I subscribe for a tango course in Bonn. You know, and they all say, you're terrible. I say, no, I was in Buenos Aires. Right? I mean, what do you know? So I, you know, I give up my money. I sell my house, leave my wife, etc., uh, in order to live in Buenos Aires, blah, blah, blah. And what would happen is that this is a false life. You could say, what ha poor guy. Right? He made a mistake. His whole life was false. And uh, uh, that is a possibility for humans, that we can lead a false life. And one way of leading a false life is being wrong about the nature of intelligence. This changes you. And we are currently wrong about the nature of intelligence because we think that we are killer apes running pro software programs that can be mined by companies. That's how we think about ourselves, which is one of the most ridiculous myths of humanity, right? It's way better to believe in, you know, the, the, the 12 most important Greek gods, right? At least they have, they're having fun. Uh, uh, these killer apes with programs, I mean, uh, that, this is like from Doctor Who. People are thinking of themselves as if they were in Doctor Who. Uh, 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 and uh, and uh, that's not good, right? So this kind of alienation is something we need to overcome. And part one and part two of my presentation of some of the ideas that you would find in the book uh, uh, are designed to support right, the kinds of critical things that I have said about uh, the forms of delusion and hallucination that are constitutive of our contemporary era. Thank you for your attention, and now I'm looking forward to discussing this with uh, Ayan. <laughs> Thank you very much for your lecture. Um, I propose that I ask one clarification question, mm -hmm. and then there will be a lot of 
uh, questions about robots and science fiction movies. Good. Yeah, I'm and glad. I thought that I'm would glad. be a good format. Yeah. So <clears throat> as in terms of clarification about uh, what thinking is, so the idea seems to be that what you argue against is mm. that whatever our mind is, is basically summed up by, I have perception, I get some signals from the outside, and then inside my whatever, yeah. there is this thing called cognition that processes that, and because of that, there would be some kind of irrecuperable abyss or, or, or problem between us, because, yeah. of course, you see things a bit differently, and we, have, we both have different kinds of factories. Yeah. But instead, thinking is a sense that goes outside of ourselves, in yeah. a sense, like yeah. existentialists would, would, would argue. So then, if I'm correct, then if we are together now, <clears throat> it is possible that we are all thinking about the same thing, namely, what the hell did you just mean by everything you said? Yeah. And it's almost <laughs> like touching different parts of the same object, but we Absolutely. are all in contact, direct, yeah. unmediated contact. Absolutely. Okay. There's Good. something I said, or some things I said, and we all have been in touch with what I've said, from different perspectives. Uh, I'm as the person who uttered those things, right? And also, your thoughts, realize, you have to realize that, all your thoughts come to you in the way in which your color experience come to you. You are not behind your thoughts and then you make them. You find them. You grasp them, as Frege says, mm. the philosopher. You grasp your thoughts. They fly around, as it were, right? Uh, um, so it's, you cannot produce them. The idea that you can produce your thoughts is incoherent because it would presuppose that, you know, before you... So imagine you think something, right? I would like, a, I would like chocolate. So that, you think, I would like chocolate. Uh, in whatever way you think this, right? I like chocolate. And it's not that before you thought, I, I would like chocolate, you had the plan to think, I would like chocolate. Because if you had the plan to think, I would like chocolate, right? then you had the plan to have the plan to think that you would like chocolate. Also, you had the plan to have the plan to have the plan to think that you like chocolate, and that's way too many plans, right? So uh, it's, an, it's a very simple infinite regress. So it means that your thoughts have to be grasped by you. They, th there has to be immediate contact with your thoughts or none. So then to... to almost get into an infinite yeah. regress and clarify the clarification. <laughs> it reminded me of this, there's this, there's this, there's this point in, uh, I don't know which book, but by, by Jean-Paul Sartre, where he says, there's this very striking reason why um, psychology and psychological treatment can be effective. Not always, but yeah. it can be effective. And that's the reason, the reason is that if you are my psychologist and I am very afraid of spiders, then my fear of spiders is not something private that is mm. hidden somewhere in the backwoods of my minds. It is out there in yeah. the world. My consciousness grasps it yeah. in a way such that I am terrified, but you, a psychologist, can grasp yeah. that very same yeah. notion and maybe it is not as intimate for you as it is for yeah. me who has that yeah. fear, but yeah. because you can grasp other parts of it, you might be able to supply information that I do not have. Yeah, thank you. It's a fantastic summary. Yeah. So you are, in, a, in that <laughs> sense... fantastic, you know, know like sense, you couldn't you, say it better. So Well, it's Sartre, so you yeah. Know, but two <laughs> thumbs up. No, no, this was better than Sartre, way better. But then yeah. the... <laughs> no, no, Sartre, I, I, Sartre it takes him 400 pages to make the point, and uh, you can better get it in yeah, three minutes. Sartre yeah, used more drugs better. than I do. Okay. So. Yeah, but, but, well, thanks, yeah. But then it would be, uh, then it would be a, a theory of, of mindedness and thinking that is, in a sense, radically um, opposed to mental privacy in a sense. So yes. this idea that what I am, what I find in myself is something deeply private, that, that my ultimate self is precisely that part of me which I can yeah. never communicate with anyone yes, else. Yes, absolutely. All right. So there's a famous idea associated with privacy called privileged access. Uh, and many people also confuse the two. But uh, so here's the idea, right? There's something that I know by being it, right? So I'm hungry by, I know I'm hungry by being it. Right? You can know I'm hungry, but not by being it. If I'm hungry, it's my hunger. Right? You cannot be hungry and know that I'm hungry, but I know better if I'm hungry or not. I'm it. Right? Mm -hmm. That's the famous idea. But that's not true. I think we know the same thing. If I know I'm hungry and you know that I'm hungry, we know the same thing. It's just that I feel hungry. Right? But the fact that I'm hungry involves me being hungry, but it's not, there's no privileged access. You might even know better that I'm hungry. Right? We know, you know, if you, if you live with people uh, uh, in close relationships, you, you know lots of things about them they don't know. 
right? And the question is always how much of that keep, do you keep hidden for strategic reasons? But, uh, um, um, uh, uh, but you know their minds, yeah, often better than they do their own. So then let's, uh, because now we get to, 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 to robots, would your theory also imply that even though it is the case that human mm. beings can do this with mm. each other, kind of get in touch with each other's thoughts, quite literally, that then computers cannot do that. Yes, absolutely. So a computer uh, can never touch, a touch in that no. sense, a thought. No, a computer, what a computer can do is it can uh, uh, see a pattern, a pattern, we don't even know which one in all cases, a pattern that is associated with my thought. Uh, for instance, I say something. Uh, uh, but many other things are associated with my thought. So a computer only um, samples a subset of reality, necessarily. Uh, so take a, you know, very simple, uh, you know, Einstein was once asked, what's the difference between model and reality? And then he said, do you have a picture of your wife? And then he showed them a picture and Einstein said, she's very beautiful, but it's very small. Yeah. <laughs> on the picture, you know. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, so that's the difference between model and reality. Uh, um, so a model differs in some in very significant ways from its target system, that, that widget models. Mm -hmm. And this happens with so-called artificial intelligence. Uh, it grasps a pattern of reality, but this only makes sense if you use it, right? Mm -hmm. If you didn't know the practice of using photos to re-identify someone, right, uh, you wouldn't know what that thing is there for. And so this is what a computer does, as it were, right? It's, it's just a brutal pattern production producing machine. It's not pattern recognition, by the way. It's pattern production. Uh, so they produce patterns. <laughs> Uh, and they destroy the environment with any pattern because it's an, it's an attack on the material energetic household of the universe. Never forget that. The whole digital reality is very physical. Uh, uh, it needs a lot of electricity for those reasons. And then, um, moving into more robots, um, I, I was wondering wh while reading the book, mm. I was wondering, is it really our... our, our biggest fear if we're if we're thinking about ai is it really our biggest fear that machines will think isn't it rather our biggest fear mm. that machines will come to occupy our cognitive space in the simple sense of being able to carry out a lot of tasks efficiently that we mm. would otherwise have to do ourselves while not thinking so the so the the contrast would be like for example you have the movie her yeah. in which uh, Scarlett Johansson plays an AI, and let's hypothetically say that in that movie, AIs can really think. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons for that is that the whole script of the movie is clearly about the AI showing very em mm -hmm. empathetic, um, uh, a very empathetic bond with, well, her owner in this sense, Joaquin Phoenix. And if you oppose that to the kind of Skynet-like intelligence mm -hmm. that you see in, uh, in Terminator or in one of the Avengers movies, then the difference is that in her, the AIs can think and therefore we can reason with mm -hmm. them. And they can actually place themselves in our, in, 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 in our position. Whereas highly capable AIs that cannot think, um, for example, in the Avengers and in, in the Terminator's movie, Terminator movies, they are precisely the ones that run rampant because they don't see us mm. as humans. So isn't the, isn't the real danger rather that we're creating stuff, machines, that come very close to thinkers, but precisely the problem being that they mm. cannot be thinkers? Yeah. Well, I think we often forget um, there's a danger of a similar form, uh, but I think it's uh, different in the following respect. Um, the entire um, architecture, digital, all of arch digital architecture, requires very regular updates, including physical updates, right? Mm -hmm. You need new iPhones every once in a while, etc., for those programs, right? So the software changes the requirements on the hardware. That's why the chips need to become smaller while the software is getting better, etc., etc., right? These are physical laws at play in the production of these uh, uh, entities. Mm -hmm. yeah? And uh, the production process is run by humans. So humans produce all effects of the machines that they're building, without knowing what they're doing. So basically... But that would then precisely be the that's problem. That's the danger. 
But it's not the machines. The machines don't do anything by themselves. The smartphone doesn't load itself. If we stop touching the machines, they break down so very soon. You know, I, don't, I, I talk to lots of people about the question how long it would take. I heard from different scientists from different fields anything, you know, some said just a couple of days to like a month, but no one said 10 years. Right? So, it, it, you know, very quickly, if we all stop immediately using our uh, electric artifacts, the electric ar architecture breaks down and uh, up to a point where there's no way to repair it. You can't even reboot it then at a certain point. Huh? So this is how historical our whole digital network is. History of human use is built into the physics of the entities. Mm -hmm. It's not mental, like with Heidegger, right? The use of the hammers in, in my mind. No, no, it's in the hammer. It's the way in which it's been touched, etc. So the, uh, and there's this a is, trace in it. There's a real physical trace in it. And this is the danger, that uh, human interactions... We would not like to control us, uh, you know, for instance, the hierarchy, social hierarchy of a Californian software uh, company. You know, the way in which the people working there relate to each other is pro is leaves traces in the product. That's obvious, right? If you get a BMW car, then people relate to them to each other in a certain way. Right? And, that, and the result of this is the, the design of the car. So the car is the expression of a social experiment. Now, do we want to live in a world whose form is exactly like the way in which people relate to each other in California? You know, so I think, you know, let's name the problem Californication. So, do, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 are we willing... To let it happen. It depends on whether you mean the television series or the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Song. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> no, a big yeah, that's there. absolutely. That's the ambivalence, you know. Yeah. But we should have the the Red Hot Chili Peppers and not the TV series. I think this is obvious. But there's know? a there's a big. Yeah. I think there's a there's a big um, uh, role played in your in your philosophy by this idea that human beings are are in a sense self determining animals. What we become, what we make of ourselves, what we make mm. of <laughs> our world is in part a result of how we think about ourselves and, yeah. and others. Do you also subscribe to a certain bandwidth of, let's say, forms uh -huh. oh, yeah. that would be acceptable yeah. or human as yeah. opposed to evil ones or inhuman yeah. ones? Yeah, thank you. That's a, a very good question. Um, so I think there is a range of possible human behavior. Acceptable but, human behavior, then. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, that's a subset of that range. Okay. So I think there are two, you know, the, the bigger scope is uh, human behavior, And there's human and inhuman behavior. Inhuman behavior is not evil. In, uh, let's call it non-human, okay? Let's just draw a distinction. There's human behavior and non-human behavior. Um, and so, so non-human behavior of an organism might be the growing of my fingernails, right? I don't do that intentionally. I cut them intentionally, but the growing just happens. Yeah? So that, uh, if that is true, it's not obviously true, but most likely true, right? Uh, uh, I don't know about fakirs, whatever they can do, right? But it's, uh, you know, to me, it looks like this shit's just growing, and then sometimes I cut it, right? I mean, this, is, uh, this seems to be the right ontology. Uh, so there are two forms of behavior. Um, and then there's a range of behavior that still counts as human, and that range might be historically variable, Uh, But at so, any given moment, there is a bandwidth. Yes, there's a bandwidth of what is human. There is human nature. Human nature is just that scope. So human nature is not an ideal. You know, humans are neither good nor bad. You know, uh, uh, um, and there's nothing that humans as such ought to do. Right? So if you think that there's something particular we ought to do, you know, be, be lovable in the eyes of God. Right? Someone could say, what should we all do? What's the meaning of life? You know? You know, do the things that God would like you to do. You know, that's a recommendation. But then how do you do this, right? And how often? If, if, if you need to do the things that God would like you to do, how often do you need to do them, right? So uh, is uh, praying like seven a day, uh, seven times a day, is that, you know, is that problem C doesn't tell you what you ought to do. So that's a problem with that proposal anyhow. But I think there's generally, I call that neo-existentialism. There's nothing that we all ought to do in general, Right? Uh, we ought to save the planet, yeah. But that's not what we all, you know, if we all did that, we wouldn't have food because we would just be, we would just be protecting plants, right? We, we, until we die, you know, because we would starve. So someone has to produce some food so that we can then take care of plants. So uh, uh, the division of labor 
is strictly constitutive for the existence of more than, say, seven humans. Uh, so we won't get rid of that structure. But then the... Um, so I can, I can see... I think I can see what would fall outside of that bandwidth by definition. That would yeah. be probably be any view that we have of ourselves that pins us down. That yes. says we are just computers so we can replace ourselves with computers. Yeah. Um, we are just a parasite upon the earth so we should er yeah. uh, erase ourselves. So then you would have kind of a negative view of what we what would not be in that yeah. bandwidth. Do you also have a positive set of, let's say, pointers, guidelines, theorems of yeah. when you are inside that bandwidth of how to behave like a human being, basically? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I think this is a, 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 an unanswerable empirical question. So I think there is something, but we will never figure it, figure it out. As Paul Feierabend once said to Edmund or about Husserl, uh, how does he know anything about Peruvian peasants? Because Husserl said, you know, humans have a certain mental framework called the life world, and he described the way humans in general are. And, uh, and then Feyerabend just says, well, what about the Peruvian peasants? He doesn't know anything about Peruvian peasants. So how did he, you know, why does he think this is an essential overall human activity? Mm. So probably uh, uh, we have no idea uh, what human forms of life currently actually exist, let alone which ones are possible, right? I mean, we have no idea what, for instance, people are up to on this one island close to India where they are, you know, reported to shoot arrows at you when you approach them. You know, they've been doing that for maybe 40,000 years. We have no clue what they're up to, right? I have no clue what, uh, you know, people are up to in various forms of, and nor do you, in various forms of, say, business in Rotterdam. You know, there are lots of things that are going on in Rotterdam that people do, and we have no clue. You know, think of, say, you know, all the drugs that go through Rotterdam uh, and who produce them and who gets killed, right? Uh, um, um, et cetera, et cetera, right? So I think uh, uh, what, what humans can do is, is an incredibly hard empirical question, and this should be the object of the so-called humanities. Mm. Because then you get the, the, the finicky problem of having to say, well, there is this bandwidth, yeah. variable as it may be. We are kind of sort of able to detect when we are outside of the bandwidth, but we're never really able to, to, to know when we're inside it. It's almost like the, the famous um, US Supreme Court decision on yeah. when or when mm -hmm. something would or not would not be porn and the yeah. verdict by the judge would be well you know it when, when you, you see, see it, it. You, know, yeah. you know what is not porn obviously this is not porn and uh, when do you see what actual porn is well you know when, it, when it's there would that be the bandwidth criterion also like you know when you're in the bandwidth you, but absolutely. there's no definition yes absolutely you know that you're in the bandwidth when you know anything yeah. So it's, the, it's what Thomas Nagel calls the hard core of self-evidence. Right? So the hard core of self-evidence is uh, that you know that you're around. You know, I'm not saying that you know that you're conscious. That's a very demanding kind of knowledge. But you know that you're around. Mm. So uh, human animals have this probably very early, this uh, a sense of self, somewhere at some point in the womb, right? Uh, there's the, the, uh, the misguided idea that we have to prog program them to have a sense of self, the idea that the ego is socially constructed. Uh, I think that's an uh, entirely false idea. Uh, humans, very early in their development, we have no idea when. Uh, uh, again, just a bandwidth at best, but we don't know when it happens. But sooner or later, there's a sense of self somewhere in your body if you are, say, a mother. Uh, uh, and uh, so that kicks in very early. And uh, uh, once you have this, you are in touch with your own animality, your thinking. I'm, I'm saying, you know, insects are thinking, you know, uh, uh, swine are thinking and snakes are thinking, you know. Are bacteria thinking? I don't know, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I wouldn't give them a lot of credit, uh, um, uh, but I might be wrong. Which also shows, by the way, that it's perfectly fine to kill animals um, because, you know, it turns out that, say, uh, you know, athlete's foot is an animal, but you do kill it, right, if it gets too bad. Right? So generally, no argue there cannot be any argument with the conclusion that thou shall not kill animals because some animals thou shall kill athlete's foot. As you're making the argument. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, or, or the mosquito, which I had to fight last night in the Goethe Institute. They have a mosquito 
problem in in the guest room, and uh, it was a long fight. Did you win? I, I won. <laughs> okay, good. I won. And I did have my Hindu moment when I thought that, damn, I just lost, you know, seven karma points on my account. So I have to do something good. Um, I, I want to uh, press this idea of the right bandwidth a bit more because towards the end of the book, in the in the in the uh, mm -hmm. postscript, basically, the, which you yourself call a pathetic yeah. postscript. Um, yeah, that translates into English in the yes, same connotation. Yeah, yeah, okay. So yeah, there, there you 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 tie your your brand of realism to um, at the very least a hope of 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 making some progress with regards to um, the post-factual age and post-truth politics, with regards to the European Union or the notion of Europe being in crisis. And you also posit this as a plea for a new form of enlightened humanism. Yeah. And the question will be like, how, how does that um, translation happen from a quite, let's say, <laughs> purely philosophical yeah. theory about what thinking is to almost wanting to save the world? Yeah. Yes. So imagine our social systems, the ones currently existing, uh, would have the following goal structure. Whatever they do, they are trying to do the best they can do on the basis of what the actor sustaining them know. Now imagine, for instance, you know, take universities as social systems or some other thing, you know, to not have the usual boring philosopher, pro philosophy professor talks about his own profession, sociology. So let me fantasize about some other institution I don't know, say McDonald's, right? So uh, 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 in McDonald's, things, you know, it's an institution, it's a social system, and a McDonald's, right, is run in a certain way. Now imagine uh, that the organization, the whole McDonald's organization, would try to uh, come up with an idea of how to feed people, feed people in the best way. They're clearly not doing that. So but, uh, so, but imagine that's what they were trying to do. At the beginning, maybe they invented cancer causing, you know, cheeseburgers, you know. Uh, but then someone says, come on, if I eat this, you know, I die. Uh, and, uh, 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 and they watch this one McDo anti McDonald's movie and all those, right? And then McDonald's says, like, damn, sorry, you know, Ronald McDonald's m makes his appearance on TV and he apologizes to all the fat kids. They who made died him green, because, you know. Also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They the color. yeah, so imagine that's what they were doing, right? And then he would say, wow, McDonald's is getting better, right? Uh, 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 that would be McDonald's getting better. Now imagine for any institution that you can think of, which tells you it has a certain function. McDonald's tells you it's there to feed you. You buy something and you die, right? So they're not giving you what you paid for. They, they're killing you, but you think they're sustaining you. So that's bad. You know, they're lying. So now imagine all institutions would have the form of truth, right? The, what they were doing is just that. On that model, you know, it's a thought experiment, we would have an ideal society. That is an ideal society. An ideal society is the place where you get the best ice cream when there's an ice cream place. Ice cream place, you go, best ice cream. <laughs> Perfect, right? Next ice cream place, equally good, right? None is worse. And then you get bored, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and then they invent better ice cream so that boredom, the boredom level is reduced. Now, imagine we had social systems with just an explicit goal structure. I'm not saying we can achieve that, uh, you know, fantasy, low, uh, you know, th those are the Loto facts from Adorno, if you remember them. If not, forget about them. But anyhow, so the, uh, uh, so the idea that, you know, there's no gap between, you know, how things ought to be and uh, how they are, and that is clearly the best of all possible worlds. And currently, our institutions don't look at all like this is what they're doing. No one thinks that any given government serves the function of trying to do the best job as a government precisely because what they're doing is the best job relative to a historical time. Right? Relative to a historical time, a politician can do certain things. But they ought to do something that is not that. Uh, that's why they're criticized in various ways and people worry about the structure of government in general. Uh, so the ideal that at the outcome of the book is to begin to change institutions in light of the very simple idea, very simple and obvious idea, that the institution should be better tomorrow. We have an institution and now what we do is we try to make it better tomorrow. Uh, and that's the goal structure that I'm suggesting. 
And uh, this would obviously correspond, right, almost analytically, mm. this would correspond to the human life form. Now, an argument against it uh, would say, what about conflict? Isn't there internal, intrinsic conflict of interest? Of course. Well, uh, you know, if we approach this, there will be conflict of interest. There's this ice cream, and then there will be a line. I want it first, right? And there cannot be a meta institution solving the line problem perfectly. That would be too expensive. Like, you know, no lines, right? So there will be conflict, but then there will be a conflict-solving institution, such as the democratic rule of law. Uh, and so the interaction of the subsystems of society should be designed in light of rationality. That's all I'm saying, and that's enlightenment. Well, then you have... Uh, yeah, you don't have to convince me, you know that I'm in your camp. Okay. But the, the, the whole okay. problem then no, becomes... No, it's fine. That <laughs> no, uh, you know, I like anti-enlightenment people. Well, I think that... Um, <laughs> If you then look at, let's just say, the forces mustered against that idea, then not just in society, but also in especially continental philosophy in the, in the last few decades, the, the shibboleth, the key um. to, to a better world, is always feeling. But no. we, in philosophy, we call it affect because it sounds mm. fancier. But it comes down to rationality is what divides us. Thinking is sterile. Thinking is stale. Thinking leads to more mm. computers and more systemization. What we need to do is have more pathos, basically. Yeah. Is that something excluded, in your view, in, within yeah, your, yeah, in yeah, your yeah. philosophy? Or is, that, or is that something that has a secondary or supplementary function? Yeah. Well, I think our feelings are, to a large extent, rational. They arise, they are fully real, but they arise as reactions to mode of thinking, right? We feel a certain way because we are thinking a certain way. And we have sp specific forms of uh, mental illness, like uh, heavy depressions, where the order is inversed, right? Where the way you feel determines the way you think. And that's why we feel disconnected if we have, you know, in, uh, if we have these states which we classify as pathological for that reason, because we're disconnected. It's the, it should be the other way around. The way we feel should be related to the way we think. There shouldn't be two selves, as it were, right? So our feelings are quite often rational. Um, so the idea that there's a feeling-thinking opposition is rejected by the, the idea that there's no thought-perception distinction. There's no deep difference between our rationality and our so-called emotions. That is basically the same thing. Because you only have a reason to do something because you are you. You know, if you like a beer, then you have a reason to drink a beer on the account of certain feelings you have, that of thirst, etc., and your habit of drinking beer sometimes, right? If you drink it too often, then it's a, you know, it turns around into this inverted structure called alcoholism. Uh, uh, um, but, you know, as long as you're in control of your behavior, the direction goes from rationality to feeling to how things are. And they merge into just the activity of buying a beer. You feel good about the thoughts. Like, you, you know, you know this. You have a thought and then you're happy. It's like, oh, yeah, you think about your wife if you're happy. Otherwise, think about something else. But I just thought about my wife. I'm happy. You know, it's like, yeah, that's a good thought. Yeah. So I feel immediately happy. Thinking about my wife and feeling happy is currently the same. Right? That's good. Right? Uh, um, and uh, thinking about chocolate and uh, having it, you know, etc. So... Uh, thought and feeling uh, don't come apart. I think that I th maybe one of the reasons for asking that question is that I think that some people, and by some people I mean me and probably some <laughs> other people as well, think that it's, uh, it sometimes seems that emotion seems to be something non-corruptible, yeah. whereas someone's thinking may be 100% evil. So this idea that even the most sadistic torturer might at some point, you know, break out crying, having sympathy with a cute animal and so on. But his thinking, his I their ideas might be 100% corrupt. Yeah. And that would then therefore be the idea that, you know, if we create more feeling and more intersubjective empathy, then we might get along and build a better mm -hmm. world. But if we have to really respect each other's thinking, then we, ha we are suddenly in a space of reasons where there are people who are 100% yeah. corrupt. Yeah. So the question will be, do you think thinking can be that corrupt? Can, is thinking something that can be corrupt? Yes. Well, I think we can draw a distinction between two notions or kinds of notions of rationality or reason. One is normative and the other just a description. On the descriptive use, uh, mm -hmm. the sadistic torture is as rational as, you know, 
Pope Francis. Yeah, and that was not a critique of the Pope. Or as whatever, Kurt Gödel. Or a yeah. compliment for torture. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, but they are equally rational, rational on that notion. On another notion, it's, uh, it's irrational to be you know, the sadistic torturer. So even though you're rational in one sense, right, you're good at torturing, you're making good plans, you know, you, 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 know, you have, you have way, way a good reputation in the, in the, in the field, you know. <laughs> you get an award every now and then. You know, awards, you know, the, you know when the Bassad invites you to dinners. And, you, know, uh, uh, you, you have a guest, uh, you know, guest tour, like I'm lecturing in the Netherlands. There, there's a, an equivalent maybe, you know, people from North Korea traveling, whatever. Uh, you know, yeah. Eastern Poland and so forth. And uh, uh, um, I, I, yeah, I don't know. Um, but so the sadistic torture can be very rational in one sense, and, but it's irrational to be that person, right. right? So in the normative sense of reason, and the space of reason debate often confuses the two. They think that you are only in the so-called space of reasons, uh, um, candidate for... Uh, uh, assessment in light of rationality uh, if you are rational in that demanding sense. If you're yeah. already within this moral... Uh, okay. Yes. Uh, and I think that this more demanding sense, uh, being rational, uh, has a specific form I simply call autonomy for obvious reasons. <laughs> autonomy is the fact that uh, you do what you do because you think of yourself as rational. Okay, so I can do what I do because I think of myself as thirsty. Now imagine I do something I do because I think of myself as rational. It's called philosophy, for instance. When you do philosophy, what you do is you think of yourself as rational. What else are you doing, right? So you try to figure something out. You ascribe the capacity to think to yourself when you do philosophy. Yeah? So thinking of yourself as rational is an exercise of rationality upon rationality. It's a rationality loop. And that rationality loop is freedom. 